Ooh. All right, you're ready. Here we go. Uh, for this problem, what it's asking us to do is it's telling us to um, find all the zeros of our function, of our polynomial function. And we also have to determine the multiplicity. So <clears throat> first thing we want to do is when we're thinking about the zeros, we need to remember what, what are the zeros of a function. And a lot of times, you know, we call the zeros of the function. What it means is, is when f of x is equal to zero. So if you think about your y-axis is your, is your values of f of x, and your x-axis is your values of x. So when f of x equals zero is this line right here, right? It's your x-axis. So if I have these points on my x-axis, that means f of x is equal to zero at each one of those points. Okay, that's where we get the name zeros. So when I want to find the zeros of this function, I know my f of x has to equal zero. All right, so in algebra one, we learned how to isolate the variable and get your x by itself, right? And we usually were deal only dealing with linear terms. A couple times we might have started getting into quadratic or uh, you know, um, square terms where we could take the, take the square root. Then in algebra two, actually when even algebra one, two, we also started learning about trinomials and factoring and getting it as a set of uh, linear terms. And that's also what we did a lot of times in algebra two as well. And we're gonna be looking for the same thing. If you can't just solve for your single x, we have to look at this and say, all right, is there any way that we can make this a set of linear term, uh, linear factors? Because if I know I can get it to say, to a multiplication problem where x times y you know, is going to equal 0, then I know that one of those two has to equal 0 and I can solve for them. Right? Either x equals to 0 or y is equal to 0. I don't know of any two numbers that multiply that give me 0. So the first thing you always want to do, whenever you're solving something or a factor, you know, whatever, you always want to look to how can you simplify it. And one way of simplifying is factoring out something that's common. And that deals with any kind of math problem you're doing. Try to always simplify the problem first. I look here and I notice that they all share an x squared. I can factor out an x squared or a lot of times divide out an x squared. So I can get 0 equals x squared, kind of reverse distributive property, equals x squared minus x minus 20. So now I can say that, all right, either x squared equals 0 or x, my, x squared minus x minus 20 equals 0. And just thinking in my head, I'm like, oh, a trinomial factoring, right? That's how like fast and easy you should be thinking, automatically, trinomial. Let me see if I can factor it. If not, I can probably solve for it. So I looked to go and see if this is factorable. And you know, my brain is just already programmed to look. Since I have a difference of one, I know I'm gonna have to have two factors that are very close together. And so I know that I'm gonna have to deal with four and five because 10 and 2, or 10 and 2, those are too far together. Adding and subtracting 10 and 2 from each other are not going to yield me a difference of 1. So without going into any factoring practice, I do have a lot of factoring videos you guys can check out. Without going into factoring practice, I can determine that this is going to be a negative 5 times an x plus 4. And I can just double check this by negative 5 times 4 is going to give me negative 20, and then negative 5 plus 4 is going to give me um, a negative one, and you know you're going to have those x's attached. So to get the zeros, remember I said x times y equals zero. Well, that's the same thing here. Zero equals x squared. X minus five equals zero, or x plus four zero. So one of these is going to equal. You know we say that all these can equal zero. So zero equals x squared. X minus 5 equals 0, and x plus 4 equals 0. Therefore, my zeros are going to be when x equals uh, 0, because obviously to solve for x, you take the square root, and you get uh, square root, you get x equals 0, x is equal to 5, and x is equal to 4, negative 4. You say, how did I do that? Well, guys, I took this. I took the square root of both sides, x equals zero. Here, I added a five to both sides. Here, I subtracted a four. So those are my zeros. Last thing it said was find the multiplicity. 
And multiplicity is going to be very important for one thing, telling you how to graph. Uh, when you have a multiplicity of two, your your graph is not is going to still have an inner is still going to have a zero at that, but it's not going to intersect. It's actually going to kind of bounce from that intercept and go back up. Um, when it does it has a multiplicity of one, that actually tells you where the graph is crossing the x-axis. So here, since I have a square root, or since I had a square, I had to take the square root, right? And so think about that. When you're taking the square root of something, you're always doing like the plus or minus. So there's like two possible solutions. So this is what we say has a multiplicity of two, and these have a multiplicity of one. And that looks really, really sloppy, I apologize. But if you guys can experiment when finding the zeros of a real function, just make sure you factor it out, factor out as best as possible, and then try to get it as a set of linear factors, and then solve them equal to zero. And then remember, if you have a square or um, you know any kind of even, any kind of even root, and you're taking that, you're going to have a multiplicity of larger than one of two that you can uh, determine what your graph. We'll talk about graphing here a little bit later.